In our part one of our documentary on suppressed inventions, we discuss some of the most groundbreaking technologies, from Nikola Tesla's discovery of free energy to the mysterious circumstances surrounding the demise of Stanley Meyer's water-powered car. In this second part, we'll continue with presenting inventions that, for various reasons ranging from corporate interests to governmental interventions, never made it to the public eye, pushed into obscurity despite their potential to revolutionize our world. Cavity Structural Effect Viktor Grebenikov was a self-taught entomologist from Russia. His journey into the unknown began with a fascination for the natural world, particularly the insect kingdom, which he believed held secrets to extraordinary powers, including anti-gravity. The cornerstone of Grebenikov's discovery was the Cavity Structural Effect, CSE a concept he derived from closely observing the structure of bee nests and the behavior of insects. It all started in the early 1980s while Grebenikov was camping in the vast Siberian steppe. While laying on the ground, he suddenly experienced an unusual sensation, only to find out he was lying atop an underground bee city. He experienced headaches, ringing ears, and a metallic taste in his mouth, which sparked his interest in the peculiarities of the natural structures around him. Delving deeper into this phenomenon, Grebenikov collected parts of the bee nest and began experimenting. He observed an unusual heat emanation from the honeycomb structures, a sensation that could not be detected or measured by conventional scientific instruments. This observation led him to theorize about the existence of a force field generated by the geometric configuration of the honeycombs, a field capable of influencing the surrounding environment in ways not previously understood by science. Grebenikov's investigations took a significant turn when he examined the chitin shells of insects under a microscope. He discovered an unusually rhythmic, extremely ordered structure that seemed to defy gravity. When he attempted to place two of these chitin plates together, one plate hovered in the air for a few seconds before aligning itself with the other. This observation was the first step toward understanding the anti-gravitational properties of certain natural structures. Convinced of the potential of his discovery, Grebenikov embarked on a project to harness the cavity structural effect for human use. He constructed a platform with thousands of chitin shells attached to its underside, creating what he claimed was an anti-gravity vehicle. According to Grebenikov, this vehicle could travel at speeds of up to 1,500 kilometers per hour and reach heights of 300 meters off the ground. More astonishingly, the device supposedly made the rider invisible from below and encased them in a bubble-like force field that nullified inertia and dynamic pressure. Despite the incredible claims and the profound implications of his work, Grebenikov faced skepticism and rejection from the scientific community. After his patent application in 1992 was denied, Grebenikov attempted to share his groundbreaking work through a book, this publication was intended to detail his discovery, outlining the principles and mechanisms behind his invention, supplemented by a wealth of full-color images and potentially including photographs from a museum demonstration of his device. However, in a turn of events that raises questions about the motives behind the decision, the publishers, potentially influenced by external pressures, significantly altered the book just before its release. This involved the removal of hundreds of images and all schematic details that were crucial for understanding Grebenikov's work. This situation begs the question, why was Grebenikov, already under scrutiny and skepticism from his peers, subjected to further efforts that seemed to undermine the evidence of his invention? A longtime colleague of Grebenikov suggested that he was part of a so-called scientific underground, which faced opposition and perhaps even persecution from the established scientific community and government bodies. Perhaps then, 
Grebenikov's inadvertent discovery was more profound and potentially disruptive than initially thought. It could be that his work touched upon a force or technology so significant that it was deemed too dangerous or too powerful to be allowed into the public domain, prompting efforts to bury his findings and silence the discussion around them. The Hemp Car In the 1940s, amidst the turmoil of World War II and the rise of the Industrial Era, Henry Ford embarked on a groundbreaking project that diverged significantly from the automotive norms of his time. Known for his innovative spirit and the revolutionary assembly line production of the Model T, Ford turned his attention towards environmental sustainability long before it became a global concern. His vision materialized in the form of a car that was not only powered by biomass fuel, but was also constructed from it with hemp being the primary material. A new idea from Ford, Ford 420, the new car made from weed. How can cops stop you for the possession of drugs when your car is made entirely out of it? Drug this initiative, while pioneering, found itself in the shadows, eclipsed by the dominant petroleum industry, which was rapidly expanding its global footprint. Ford's interest in renewable resources and sustainable materials was not a sudden revelation. He had long advocated for the integration of agriculture with industry, believing that farms could serve as a vital source of raw materials for manufacturing. The concept of the hemp car was a direct manifestation of this belief, showcasing Ford's commitment to exploring alternative materials and fuels. The car's body was made from a composite material that included hemp fibers, which, when combined with other plant fibers, resulted in a lightweight, durable, and biodegradable product. This material was not only environmentally friendly, but also boasted a tensile strength reportedly 10 times that of steel, offering significant safety benefits alongside its ecological advantages. Moreover, the hemp car was designed to run on hemp biofuel, derived from the seeds of the cannabis plant. This choice of fuel was emblematic of Ford's vision for a future where automobiles would not be reliant on non-renewable energy sources. The use of hemp biofuel presented a sustainable, clean-burning alternative to gasoline, promising a reduction in harmful emissions and a move towards greater energy independence. The public unveiling of the hemp car in 1941 was a spectacle that drew considerable attention. Ford demonstrated the resilience of the car's body through a sledgehammer test, where the material withstood blows without showing signs of damage, a testament to its remarkable durability. Despite the innovative features and the environmental benefits of the hemp car, the project did not progress beyond its initial demonstration. The reasons for this are manifold, with the prevailing petroleum interests of the time playing a significant role. The mid-20th century marked a period of rapid expansion for the oil industry, with petroleum becoming the lifeblood of the global economy. This shift towards oil-based energy sources created an environment where alternative fuels and materials, such as those proposed by Ford, faced significant obstacles in terms of acceptance and implementation. The economic and political clout of the petroleum industry, coupled with its strategic importance, meant that initiatives like the hemp car were sidelined. The legal and cultural landscape of the time also contributed to the project's demise, with hemp cultivation facing increasing restrictions due to its association with psychoactive strains of cannabis. These factors, combined with the onset of World War II and the subsequent shift in industrial priorities, led to the hemp car project being largely forgotten. The Radiant Energy Device in the 1930s, a period marked by scientific breakthroughs and the burgeoning of modern physics, an inventor named T. Henry Moray introduced a device that he claimed could harness the boundless energy of the cosmos. 
This radiant energy device, as Moray described it, was purported to tap into the unseen forces of the universe, offering a limitless source of power that could potentially revolutionize the way humanity generated and used energy. However, despite its promising premise, Moray's invention was met with skepticism, discreditation, and even sabotage, leading to a contentious chapter in the history of alternative energy research. Moray, an electrical engineer and physicist from Salt Lake City, Utah, was deeply influenced by the pioneering work of Nikola Tesla and other scientists who explored the frontiers of electromagnetism and radioactivity. Drawing on these influences, Moray theorized that the space around us is filled with a form of energy that, if properly harnessed, could provide an inexhaustible power source. His device, which he began developing in the early 1920s, aimed to convert this cosmic energy into electrical power using a complex arrangement of semiconductors, capacitors, and other electrical components. The core of Moray's invention was a special valve, a semiconductive material that he claimed could absorb radiant energy from the environment and convert it into high-voltage electricity. This process, according to Moray, did not violate the laws of thermodynamics, as it merely converted existing energy from one form to another. He demonstrated his device on numerous occasions, reportedly powering lights, radios, and motors in front of witnesses without any apparent external power source. Despite these demonstrations, the scientific community remained largely skeptical of Moray's claims. Critics argued that the device's operation and the theory behind it were not adequately explained or documented in a manner that could be independently verified or replicated. The lack of a clear theoretical framework that aligned with established physics further fueled skepticism, as did Moray's reluctance to disclose the full details of his invention, citing concerns over intellectual property and the potential for misuse. The situation was further complicated by allegations of sabotage and persecution. Moray reported that his work had attracted the attention of powerful interests who sought to suppress his invention, fearing its impact on the existing energy sector. He claimed to have been threatened, his laboratory ransacked, and his equipment damaged in attempts to halt his research. As the years passed, Moray continued to refine his device and advocate for its potential, but he was unable to secure the support needed to bring his invention to fruition. After Moray's death, his invention faded into obscurity, remembered more as a curious footnote in the annals of alternative energy than as the revolutionary breakthrough he had envisioned. Perpetual Motion Victor Schauberger, an Austrian forester, naturalist, and inventor, spent a significant portion of his life studying the dynamics of water flow and natural energy. Born in 1885, Schauberger's observations of the natural world led him to develop theories and inventions that many have since associated with the concept of perpetual motion a principle proposing a machine or system that can operate indefinitely without an external source of energy. It's crucial to note, however, that Schauberger himself never claimed to have developed perpetual motion machines. Instead, his focus was on understanding and utilizing the natural power of the Earth, particularly vortices in water flow, which he believed could be harnessed for beneficial purposes. Schauberger's approach was deeply rooted in his observation of nature. He believed that modern technology and engineering ignored the harmonious principles found in natural systems, which, according to him, could lead to energy generation without the cost of environmental degradation. His famous aphorism, understand nature, then copy nature, reflects the core of his philosophy. Schauberger argued that water, when allowed to flow in a vortex, could create its own energy through implosion, a concept that stood in contrast to the explosion-based technologies like combustion engines, which dominate human technology. 
One of Schauberger's most notable contributions was his research into vortex dynamics. He observed that water in rivers and streams naturally follows a meandering spiral path and posited that this motion is essential for maintaining the water's vitality and energy. By mimicking these patterns, Schauberger invented several devices intended to produce energy or propulsion. His repulsion, for example, was a saucer-shaped machine designed to generate propulsion through a series of specially designed wave-like patterns that would create a vortex of air or water. This device captured the imagination of many, leading to speculation that Schauberger had unlocked the secrets of perpetual motion and free energy. His work attracted the attention of the Nazi regime during World War II, and there are accounts of him being coerced into developing his inventions for military use, an experience that reportedly left him disillusioned and wary of the potential misuse of his discoveries. After the war, Schauberger continued his research, but his inventions never achieved the commercial success or scientific recognition he hoped for. The controversy surrounding Schauberger's work intensified after he was taken into custody by U.S. intelligence agents and held for nine months. During this period, all of his documents and prototypes were confiscated, and he was interrogated about his inventions and his activities during the war. This episode has fueled speculation suggesting that Schauberger's innovations in harnessing natural energies were of such potential that they were considered a threat to the established scientific, economic, and political order, leading to their alleged suppression by the U.S. government. Coral Castle Coral Castle is an oolitic limestone structure located in Homestead, Florida, and stands as one of the most mysterious architectural feats of the 20th century. Created single-handedly by Edward Leeds Colnan from 1923 to 1951, this monumental structure weighs approximately 1,100 tons. The technology behind Coral Castle, as well as the techniques employed by Leeds Colnan, remain subjects of speculation and intrigue with theories ranging from ancient sciences to unknown forms of energy. Edward Leeds Collins' early life was marked by profound heartbreak after he was rejected by his 16-year-old fiancée in Latvia. He then embarked on a journey to the United States, where he was later diagnosed with terminal tuberculosis. Remarkably, however, he claimed to have cured himself using magnets, which also marked the beginning of the mysterious construction of Coral Castle. He began to build what he initially called Rock Gate Park, dedicating it to the lost love of his life. Leitz Kalnan, who stood just over five feet tall and weighed only 100 pounds, worked alone, mostly at night, so no one could see his methods. He claimed to have discovered the secrets of the pyramids, which allowed him to move and carve massive stones. The stones used in the construction are massive, with some blocks weighing as much as 30 tons. Stunningly, local teenagers who claimed to have seen Leeds Kalnan work at night described how they observed the massive stones moving as if manipulated by some supernatural force. Many speculated that he employed some form of ancient technology or knowledge that has since been lost to time. Leeds Kalnan was secretive about his methods, but he did offer some clues. He suggested that he understood the laws of weight and leverage well, and photographs from the time show him using tripods made from timber. However, these tools seem insufficient for the task leading to theories that Leeds Kalnan had a deep understanding of magnetic forces and used this knowledge to lift and move the stones. One popular theory about Coral Castle's construction involves the use of electromagnetic energy or Earth's magnetic field. Leeds Kalnan published several pamphlets on magnetic currents, indicating his deep interest and possible reliance on magnetic forces for the construction of Coral Castle. He believed that all matter consisted of individual magnets 
and that this inherent magnetism could be harnessed to achieve seemingly impossible feats. So if you reverse the magnet force with a force of some kind of electromagnetic radio perhaps frequency, you can then make these rocks not as heavy as they seem otherwise, and therefore you can lift them. Another theory suggests that Leedskalnen used acoustic levitation, a method that uses sound waves to lift and move objects. Some researchers propose that by tuning into the resonance frequency of the stones, Leedskalnen could have made them easier to move. This theory is supported by ancient legends and modern experiments that demonstrate the potential of sound to manipulate physical objects. Despite these theories, no definitive evidence has been found to conclusively explain how Leeds Kalman constructed Coral Castle. The secrecy surrounding his methods and the lack of eyewitnesses have only deepened the mystery. Today, Coral Castle serves as a museum and tourist attraction, drawing visitors from around the world who are fascinated by its history and the mystery of its construction. The technology behind Coral Castle remains one of the great unsolved mysteries of the modern world. The Wasp X-Jet The quest for innovative vertical takeoff and landing VTOL systems has led to numerous experimental designs, one of the most intriguing being the Williams X-Jet. Developed by Williams International, a company recognized for its engineering prowess in turbofan technology, the X-Jet emerged as a groundbreaking VTOL system. Also known as the Williams Aerial Systems Platform, or the WASP, this compact, lightweight aircraft was powered by a turbofan aircraft engine, showcasing a blend of simplicity and advanced engineering that set it apart from other VTOL concepts of its time. It was designed to carry a single operator who could control the aircraft by simply leaning in the desired direction of travel and adjusting the power. This intuitive control mechanism, combined with the X-Jet's agility, allowed for movements in any direction, rapid acceleration, hovering, and rotation on its axis. The aircraft boasted an impressive capability to stay aloft for up to 45 minutes, reaching speeds of up to 60 miles per hour, making it an exceptional vehicle for personal transportation. Despite its innovative design and capabilities, the Williams X-Jet's journey was not without challenges. In the 1980s, the U.S. Army evaluated the X-Jet as part of its ongoing exploration of new VTOL technologies. The military's interest in such systems was driven by the potential for enhanced mobility and flexibility on the battlefield, beyond what conventional helicopters and fixed-wing aircraft could offer. The X-Jet presented an intriguing option for individual soldier mobility. However, after thorough evaluation, the U.S. Army concluded that the Williams X-Jet, while innovative, was inferior to the capabilities provided by helicopters and small unmanned aircraft. The decision was based on several factors, including the X-Jet's limited range and payload capacity compared to helicopters and the rapidly advancing technology of unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs which offered greater versatility without risking a pilot's life. Additionally, the operational complexities and training requirements for safely piloting the X-Jet presented logistical challenges for its integration into military operations. Although this technology wasn't suppressed, and it would be an improvement in people's daily life, it wasn't utilized as it was too expensive and relatively hard to fly. The exploration of VTOL technology continues to evolve, with new designs and concepts emerging that build upon the foundational work of projects like the Williams X-Jet. The Cloudbuster Although we already talked about Wilhelm Reich's orgone accumulator, the healing device that used orgone energy to cure many people, this wasn't the only invention made by Reich. His interest in orgone energy led him to believe that this energy could be harnessed for various purposes, 
including the manipulation of weather. According to Reich, orgon energy was present throughout the atmosphere and could be concentrated and directed to dissolve cloud formations, thereby inducing rainfall. The Cloudbuster device, developed in the 1950s, was the practical application of his theories. It consisted of a set of hollow tubes connected to cables that were immersed in water, which Reich claimed could draw orgone energy from the atmosphere and direct it to disperse cloud cover or, conversely, to form clouds and precipitate rain. Reich conducted several experiments with the Cloudbuster, claiming successes in rainmaking in various locations, including a well-documented experiment at a blueberry farm in Maine, where he alleged to have broken a drought and saved the crop. These experiments attracted attention, not all of which was positive. Critics dismissed Reich's claims, citing a lack of scientific rigor and reproducible results, while supporters hailed the potential of the Cloudbuster to address drought and other weather-related challenges. The legal and governmental challenges faced by Reich and his Cloudbuster project were, in part, a consequence of the broader controversy surrounding his work on orgon energy. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration, FDA, initiated an investigation into Reich's practices, particularly his claims regarding the health benefits of orgon energy and the use of organ accumulators, devices designed to concentrate and harness orgone energy for therapeutic purposes. The FDA's scrutiny extended to the Cloudbuster as part of its broader campaign against Reich's organomic research. In 1956, following a series of legal battles, Reich was sentenced to prison for contempt of court, related to his refusal to comply with an injunction against the distribution of organ-related materials. The controversy surrounding the Cloudbuster was thus intertwined with the wider legal actions against Reich, which culminated in the destruction of his publications and organ accumulators by the FDA, an act that has been described by some as a dark moment in the annals of scientific censorship. The Original Electric Car The tale of the General Motors EV-1, the world's first mass-produced electric car, is a clear example of the suppression of emerging technologies due to industrial interests. Launched in the late 1990s, the EV-1 represented a bold foray into electric mobility, a glimpse into a future where automobiles no longer relied on fossil fuels. However, the journey of the EV-1 was abruptly halted, sparking debates that continue to resonate today, especially in the context of the 2006 documentary, Who Killed the Electric Car? The EV-1 emerged from General Motors as a pioneering effort to address the growing concerns over air pollution, oil dependency, and the environmental impact of conventional vehicles. With 800 units available for lease, the EV-1 quickly garnered a dedicated following, appreciated for its innovation, efficiency, and the statement it made about the potential for a cleaner automotive future. Yet. Despite the enthusiasm it generated among a niche group of environmentally conscious drivers, General Motors announced the end of the EV1 line in 1999, a mere few years after its introduction. Their cause for discontinuing the EV once centered on economic considerations, primarily the limited driving range of the car's batteries, which they argued made the vehicle unprofitable to produce and maintain. According to General Motors, the technology at the time could not meet consumer expectations for range and convenience, making the EV one a challenging proposition for widespread adoption. However, this explanation did not satisfy many observers. Skeptics and supporters of the EV speculated that there were other forces at play, specifically the influence of the oil industry. The argument goes that oil companies, whose business model relies on the continued dominance of internal combustion engine vehicles, viewed the advent of electric cars like the EV as a direct threat to their profits and market position. According to this perspective, 
pressure from these powerful interests led General Motors to not only discontinue the EV, but also to take extraordinary measures to erase its existence. A policy was issued by General Motors to hunt and destroy every last EV one. Rather than allowing the leased vehicles to remain with their enthusiastic users or preserving them as part of automotive history, General Motors systematically retrieved and crushed the EV1S, effectively ensuring that the technology would not advance beyond its prototype stage. This decision has been interpreted by many as an attempt to stifle the development of electric vehicle technology, keeping it from challenging the status quo of the automotive market. Today, as electric vehicles gain increasing market share and acceptance, the story of the EV1, with all its controversy and mystery, underscores the notion that the path to progress is often unplugged and uncertain. Project XA The story of Dr. James D. Mould and his cancer-free cigarettes is one that would incense every smoker and every person who has lost a loved one due to the effects of tobacco smoking. The history of cigarette advertising and the tobacco industry's practices regarding the disclosure of health risks is a controversial chapter. It's a well-known fact that for decades, tobacco companies engaged in aggressive advertising campaigns that not only promoted smoking as a desirable and socially acceptable habit, but also employed tactics that downplayed or outright denied the health risks associated with smoking. One of the most notorious aspects of these campaigns was the use of advertisements that featured doctors or implied medical endorsement, creating a misleading narrative about the safety of cigarettes. In the early to mid 20th century, Cigarette advertisements were ubiquitous, appearing in magazines, newspapers, billboards, and later on television. These ads were designed to appeal to a broad audience, including women, men, and even teenagers, using various themes such as glamour, masculinity, sophistication, and stress relief. Starting in the 1950s, Research began to shed light on the detrimental health effects of smoking, but tobacco companies fought vigorously to discredit these findings. They funded their own research to create doubt about the health risks, embarked on public relations campaigns to maintain the social acceptability of smoking, and lobbied politicians to prevent or weaken regulation. This leads us to 1955 when a scientist named Dr. James D. Mould embarked on groundbreaking research with Liggett and Myers, a tobacco company based in North Carolina. Tasked with identifying carcinogenic components in cigarette smoke, Mould's research focused on substances that cause cancer in laboratory mice. This endeavor led to the inception of Project XA, a bold initiative aimed at creating a safer cigarette by eliminating or reducing these harmful ingredients. Project XA represented a significant departure from traditional cigarette manufacturing. Mold, with support from Liggett and collaboration with the AD Little Company, dedicated himself to developing a cigarette that wouldn't contribute to cancer. After 25 years of rigorous research and development, Mold introduced the XA, also known as the Palladium Cigarette. This innovative product utilized palladium and magnesium nitrate to neutralize cancer-causing substances in cigarette smoke. Laboratory tests confirmed the efficacy of these cigarettes in reducing cancer incidents among lab animals, marking a potential breakthrough in tobacco product safety. However, despite the initial backing from Liggett, the project encountered insurmountable obstacles. The company's executives, influenced by legal counsel, decided to withdraw support for Project XA. The lawyers argued that introducing a safer cigarette could expose the company to a deluge of lawsuits from consumers harmed by their traditional products. This legal concern effectively halted the progress of Project XA forcing Mould to abandon over two decades of work. Liggett's directive to Mould to keep his findings unpublished ensured that the public remained unaware of the potential for safer cigarettes, 
leaving the health risks of conventional tobacco products unaddressed. Another reason the palladium cigarette never made it to the shelves was because Liggett didn't want to break ranks with other tobacco giants like Philip Morris. Although the company knew that the product would be commercially viable and marketable, they were more worried about the potential retaliation from other tobacco companies in the industry. The cessation of Project XA, after an investment of approximately $10 million, underscores a troubling chapter in the history of tobacco research. Worse still, Liggett and other tobacco giants continued to sell cancer-causing cigarettes, even though they were fully aware of the health risks associated with what they sold. The Hendershot Generator Lester Hendershot was an American inventor in the late 1920s, claimed to have developed a device capable of generating free energy. The Hendershot generator, as it came to be known, was said to harness the Earth's magnetic field to produce electricity without the need for fuel. This remarkable invention had the potential to revolutionize the world's energy landscape, offering an unlimited source of power that could render traditional energy sources obsolete. Lester Hendershot's invention was described as a self-running generator, a device that purportedly created energy through a series of coils and capacitors without the need for an external power source. Hendershot's demonstrations of the device in the late 1920s reportedly showed it powering light bulbs and motors, captivating the imagination of the public and drawing the attention of both the media and potential investors. Despite the initial excitement, a strong campaign to undermine his technology was underway, with some detractors going as far as publicly demonstrating a device they claimed was Hendershot's, attempting to prove its ineffectiveness. This act of discreditation signaled to Hendershot's supporters that there were concerted efforts to undermine his work. Undeterred, Hendershot persisted with his free energy generator for many years, by the late 1960s, he believed he had a breakthrough that would interest the U.S. Navy, preparing two models and a detailed 56-page proposal. Nevertheless, his proposal was denied. In April 1961, as Hendershot's son was returning from school, he found his father dead. Officially recorded as a suicide, the absence of a thorough investigation led many, including his family, to suspect foul play, theorizing that his innovative work posed a significant threat to large energy corporations. Rumors circulated that Hendershot had been warned by a major corporation, which he declined to name, to cease all work related to his generator, underlining the potential disruption his invention could cause to their lucrative business. Allegedly, Hendershot accepted $25,000 under the condition he halted his research for two decades. He had expressed fears for his safety to his family, indicating the gravity of the threats he faced. Hendershot's death and the suppression of his invention continued to provoke deep questions. The discussion of all of these suppressed inventions we showed you is both enlightening and disheartening, revealing how these innovations intersect with power and greed. These tales of suppressed inventions are a collective loss for our society, which is deprived of potentially transformative technologies and solutions. Yet, within these stories of suppression, there lies a resilient thread of hope. We must continue questioning and seeking out hidden truths, while also advocating for a world where innovation is not denied due to economics and politics, but embraced for its potential to improve the human condition. Thank you for watching. If you want to learn about more inventions like these, you can watch the first part of these series. The link is in the top pinned comment.